Hey, welcome back to season two of Detection at Scale. I'm here again with uh, Dr. Anton Chuvakin. I like to say doctor just because I think it's it's kind of a cool accomplishment to highlight. And Anton is uh, has a, such a wealth of knowledge on anything related to detection and SIM and, and all things security. So Anton, welcome back. Perfect. Thank you. And again, I am very happy. You mentioned the doctor. I'm not obsessed about it, but definitely appreciate it. It did take years of my life. <laughs> I see it in so many places. I feel like I just can't ignore it. The context for this conversation was that I wrote a blog post about how sims are evolving into data lake sims. And we had a little bit of conversation back and forth on LinkedIn. And someone mm -hmm. had suggested we we get on and, and discuss this and uh, in a somewhat timely fashion as well. You, you came out with your blog post about the decoupled sim. So I think that this is a trend that we could spend a lot of time talking about, and I'm actually really excited to talk about it. So why don't we just jump right in? So what is the decoupled SIM and what compelled you to write about it? That's a good question. And I think that what compelled me is definitely LinkedIn discussions. And I think specifically people making kind of broad, firm statements uh, like X is the future or Y is dead. And I'm almost... I guess I'm old enough to see that in our industry, almost nothing is ever truly dead. And, you know, IDS was dead in 2003. And of course, we still use IDS and or equivalent technology. So in that sense, saying that X is the future or Y is dead is almost always wrong. So I kind of thought, no, there must be some kind of a nuance to that. And uh, do I want uh, my security vendor to invent new storage technology? That sounds like a stupid idea. So maybe... I should rely on a storage vendor for storage and on security vendor for security. But then I go back and think to my old, my dark past uh, with the previous generation of SIM vendors that relied on relational databases. And they all said, we don't know storage. We're just going to rely on the storage vendor of the moment, which at the time probably was Oracle. And the results over time turned out to be bad. So... It's almost like a weird conundrum. We started with people using commercial off-the-shelf storage, generic storage for SIM. Some kind of badness happened. People said, then they said, we're going to reinvent it and we're going to build our own storage. And they did. And everything's happy and great. And then now suddenly we're like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> we should just use this beautiful cloud skill storage we have and things would be great. And I'm like, eh, the previous time, that's what you said when you switched away from commercial storage. So I was kind of befuddled myself. Like, what is right? And is there right? And that's what compelled me to write a somewhat inconclusive blog after reading yours and after reading, reading the, uh, I think, Ross's LinkedIn post, mm -hmm. where he also made a strong statements about security and data and stuff like that. So this is the story. Why do you think this is happening now? Cloud storage isn't new. S3 is one of the oldest services Amazon offers. So why do you think this is emerging as a thing mm. people are talking about now? This is tricky, and I don't think I have a crisp, beautiful answer. It is possible that we've run the runway to the end of the previous storage choices. It's almost like when Splunk and Elastic and others, and even ArcSight at the time, and other SIM vendors, pretty much everybody switched to their own storage of different types. They improved things over RDBMS, but alongside security evolution, storage evolved. And we now have, you know, BigQuery, we have Snowflake, we have all sorts of other beautiful cloud scale storage options, right? And maybe the question of whether to use log specific storage or general storage should be answered differently today compared to 2010, nine. Maybe, maybe the runway of the previous tech is over. Maybe they've, they're going to either take off and change or they're going to be kind of boxed as a smaller business solution. I don't know. That part is a hypothesis. I mean, there's a clear pattern that I've seen at least, which is people have a SIM that has a subset of their data. And hey, wouldn't it be great to get all of our data or the yes. the part of the big data that matters? And I think that's where this originates from. This is though is a risky statement to make because this is exactly how the previous revolution in the opposite direction happened. I have my 
this is 2007, I have my arc site, my net forensics, my whatever else there was there, and it has a subset because it only parses some things and it doesn't have any concept of raw storage. And then Splunk comes in or LogLogic comes in and later Elastic comes in and they say, ah, this parsing stuff. No, just load up all the stuff. But we are now in the same place, almost like <laughs> mm -hmm. when people have a subset of data in the in that generation of tools that used to promise full storage. I mean, I so, think we hit that limit a long time ago, though, at least for me as a practitioner. Yeah. I hit that limit 10 years ago when I came to Silicon Valley. I was on a team that had an enormous amount of data, and we tried to put it into one of the vendors, and it just completely failed. And I think that's been a pattern for a long time. And obviously, Sim has there's mul multiple ways that it can like quote unquote fail. Yeah. But on the most basic sense, it's like, can you have all the data in one place? That's not really a solved problem yet. And I think that's why we're even talking about this, right? Yes, correct. And I think that the creative beautiful, intelligent filtering is part of the current zeitgeist. I think I'm talking about Cribble and similar thing, similar vendors where, uh, and even we're not even touching on decentralized federated storage. So filtering probably won't be like the answer for everybody. Like it, it helps a lot if your vendor is, if your SIM vendor is not scaling, I can't put another vendor between your sources and your SIM vendor, and it would do some filtering magic and aggregation and amazing interesting things that will preserve the value of the data without overrunning the volume but that still is not a way to hit all use cases sometimes i really do want all the data i mean like no no nuance and there's some massive set of vendors in that space not even just filtering but also etl mm -hmm. and that's emerging even more so and i think the market does support decoupling as an observation but i think on a very basic sense on data source to its destination, but not really beyond that. Because as you point out in your Medium post, if you decouple everything, then you have a completely decoupled experience too. And we all know that security teams are, are uh, short-staffed or you know just really can't focus on gluing all these things together. So it's really an interesting paradox happening. From your perspective, if you're saying integration is really important, then is decoupling not going to work broadly? So this is very painful, and I think it's almost, I almost, I think uh, somebody called me an idiot on um, Facebook, funny enough, and not that I engage in many technical discussions on Facebook, but I've brought up a point that for some organizations, any kind of engineering or gluing things together is a, just a non-starter. They want to consume security. They don't want to engineer anything. They say, we have a problem. Problem is X. We're going to go search for anti-X. <laughs> and then somebody says, yeah, we stop X or we handle X. So we collect X and make analysis of it. And they buy, they buy that and they deploy and they X is at least somewhat solved. And if it doesn't get solved, they throw this away and say better anti X or next generation anti X. And that's all they do. They are vendor managers. So if you talk to them about gluing anything together, they look at you like you are the dinosaur from outer space. I don't know. I'm really mixing metaphors. Like, what do you mean this? I, I want a SIM. Just here's the money. Give me SIM. And that's, they don't want to know about things like ETL or, oh yeah, for OCSF, you can directly load to storage. But for this type of data, this goes through log stash here and then it goes to this pipeline and then into storage. Like all of this sounds like, no, I don't want that. I just want a SIM. Here's money. Give me SIM. Integrated seem to be the answer still even today for, for this crowd. How do you feel about the idea of, well, let's talk actually a little bit about operating on top of data that exists, because this is a pattern that we're seeing a lot of. And by the way, security is completely unoriginal in this case, because if you go look at Snowflake and Databricks, yep. all those patterns are what you need to just do good intelligence on anything, right? Like any type of data. And there's a lot of really interesting um, talks out there about how people are doing this uh, on uh, on top of Databricks for security, like namely mm -hmm. Apple, like Dom it was the guy who had the, the famous talk like at the Databricks uh, conference, and it was super fascinating. But then you listen to him and it's like, this is just normal data engineering applied to security. 
I don't know, like, what's your read on this shift to uh, the, the data platforms themselves? And do you think that, and this might be a crazy statement, but like, do you think that someone like a Snowflake or a Databricks is going to be the next Splunk in that they start generalized, but then they're like, okay, actually, all these concepts are needed for security, so we're going to do that now. Okay, so I need to be really careful here because when it happened the previous time, I sort of bet against the market because I bet that these approaches would fail and they they beautifully failed. Think Cloudera and Hortonworks, mm -hmm. they all said, hey, we have the data platform, we're just going to hire some security guys, some really smart guys, and they would build content, they would build detection, all analytics is largely the same. And their success record is roughly zero and their failure record is roughly 100%. <laughs> so, and I can, you know, poke fun at how they went about it wrong, but it's very hard for me today to bet the opposite way. Like some analytics is similar and some of the primitives, some of the, you know, things you would do are similar, or like search is similar, but I don't know. It, it just hasn't in the long term, at least in the past, this security specialist ended up on top. And the generalist, with few exceptions, end up in the ditch. So that's why my preconceived notion is to bet against the generalists. But you can tell me that, but Anton, you're so 2010. Things are completely different now. And I won't know what to tell you because maybe they are. And in this case, I'm wrong. <laughs> but but historically, I'm, I was leaning to bet against the Gen general platforms and then that on on the security specialists and that ultimately that's what happened in the past doesn't that contrast a little bit of what happened with elastic and splunk though because they started general right it does contrast what happened with splunk i elastic to me is jury still out i don't want to judge vendors it's fortunately not my job anymore but mm. let's leave them out <laughs> i'm not paid to judge vendors anymore so i don't want to judge vendors but uh i think that uh, splunk is absolutely a contrarian example uh, of, some, mm -hmm. of, of somebody who started with a general data platform and then ramped up security strength. But I feel like Splunk genuinely built a lot of security knowledge and it was a multi-year, decade plus journey from them first being mentioned in the footnotes of a CMMQ. I don't recall what it was, but I'm pretty sure they were mentioned in a footnote by somebody. And by the way, there's this cool upstart vendor called Splunk that are trying to do X. 10 years later, they're sim leader for 10 years, maybe. Again, I, I don't have yeah. an MQ in front of me, but, but the point is that it took hard work, genuine hard work to build security content, security relationships, security workflows, a uh, couple of miss bets bet that I don't want to judge as well. Some things worked out, some things didn't, but it wasn't like, Hey, now we become magically a security platform, even though they were a data platform. And then from Tuesday next week, it's happening. Like, I don't think that happened. Moreover, some people who tried that have very much ended up not where Splunk ended up. <laughs> and, and then their journey, I have one particular vendor in mind that I don't want to name, <laughs> that tried to shift from IT to security and hit the ditch and hit the wall and ended up in the ditch. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Splunk was a beautiful success story in this regard. They're still, I mean, they're still the leader. I think everyone yeah. accepts that, right? Like, yep. and under Cisco, it should be really interesting to see how that boosts their their channel for their business. And obviously, it's going to because Cisco is such a massive machine. So it's interesting to see like that full circle. And then I think we've seen a few others play out as well. I mean, we saw um, something similar with Sumo, where they like were general and then uh, pivoted into security and then they were acquired by PE. So I mm -hmm. think it's just interesting to see how the, how everything's evolving, but cloud, I think has a lot to do with a lot of this, meaning the transition in the cloud. Yes. There's been this interesting sequence of things where you had, you know, I'll call the 2010s cohort of tools, the mm -hmm. Splunk, Elastics, and like they yep. have done a great job of solving those problems. And then there was like this intermediate period in the middle where it was like the traditional sims, but run on the cloud, which mm -hmm. didn't really work, I guess, as much. Uh, like that's too harsh. That's too harsh. I think that uh, I'm thinking Securonix and Exabeam, mm -hmm. I think they transitioned to cloud. I think they've, I mean, if this were 2017, we can poke fun about how their 
just trying, whatnot. But ultimately, again, I promise not to judge vendors. And guess what I'm doing, judging vendors. Uh, but I'm judging them positively. Ha ha, don't hate me. Uh, I think it worked out for them, but the cloud transition. Still trying to pick apart why we are where we are. So it's like, because mm. if you think about it, if it had the wide appeal, then wouldn't they be more prominent than Splunk? Because I think Splunk yeah. is still widely accepted as like the best thing because maybe it goes back to your point of like integration, mind share. It's like the IBM quote, right? Like no one ever got fired for mm, buying no, would you? Yeah. IBM, right? Like I think that's that's like the, the joke around it. It's like, okay, well, I'm just going to do this because we, we have enough repeatability here. But there's something about this cloud transition that I don't think we've nailed yet. And I think we're still yes. trying to figure it out, right? Like we don't know if it's decoupled, if it's microservices, if it's AI agents doing everything for us, you know. I, or maybe it's federated storage of some sort. We don't know, but but I think you're right that it's not a solved problem. And this is also kind of peculiar because what I've observed sometimes is people highlight challenges in a typical SOC. And it was like a surreal story. I was looking at some deck built by somebody about challenges in SOC and they had the six challenges. And I looked at this deck and I thought, holy cow, when I came to Net Forensics. 20 years ago, I think we had the same slide and it had the same exact challenges. And I had this kind of like moment of like explosion in my head, like, holy cow, why is 2023 SOC challenges is the same as 2003 SOC challenges with almost no difference? Like that to me points at something being some change is coming somehow because it, it can't not change. We are, we can't be spending all this time to build new technologies and ultimately ending up with the same problems. It's a little, feels a little off. And I don't know whether it's AI or federated storage or some unique cloud storage that would fix it, but we haven't fixed it. You're right. The more I think about it, the more I agree with you that integration is probably going to be the fastest way to time to value. And that sounds very obvious when you say mm -hmm. it out loud, right? But there's still this desire to decouple things but going to going back to cloud in my post the thing that i wrote was mm. moving to the cloud necessitated us to take a new uh, effectively a new foundational approach to our architectures and i think mm -hmm. that's one of the catalysts to why we're having this conversation do you agree that that data lakes are actually required or at least a data lake architecture is required to do sim in 2023 regardless of if it's decoupled or not we have we have to agree on a clear definition of data lake architecture versus, well, not data lake architecture. Would would somebody back end into Hadoop in 2013 have a data lake architecture? I would say probably yes. What about somebody mm -hmm. back end into Elastic? Would they be in a data lake architecture? But Elastic is oh, a data lake. Why not? Oh, yeah, great. But so fine. So what, what does it mean in this case, a data lake architecture? From my perspective, a data lake architecture is commodity storage with um, separated compute on top of that. So data lives in a structured format and mm -hmm. it's almost like a data warehouse-ish, right? I mean, what's the data warehouse? It's a massive relational database that can process petabytes of logs, right? Mm -hmm. The data lake decouples storage and compute, right? And that's Snowflake's yep. whole like marketing campaign there. And then now there's the yep. data lake house that, you know, Databricks has been coining. So there's, there's a lot of evolution here, but the gist is um, structured data in some format in commodity storage. And then you have some way of, of loading it that's not completely tied to storage. So they're decoupled. Mm -hmm. We're using the word decoupled. Again, de right? de de decoupled. Yeah, we are overloading the term decoupled, but it's decoupled of on the storage layer. Ooh, so this is a hard one. Is this required? I would assume the question would be required for scale, right? Yeah. Because for, if, it, if, if not for scale, I don't really see why it's required. Because if you have uh, a cluster of, let me pick something unimpressive. A cluster of MySQL servers. Okay, that's mm -hmm. as unimpressive as it goes. If I store data in a cluster of MySQL servers, I'm not doing the data lake architecture, but at small scale and medium scale, that probably would be fine, right? Probably, but not from a utility perspective. If we go back to like, what are the problems we're solving? Or if we define what the problems we're solving are, maybe that's actually important here, right? Like, what are we, what are we doing in a sim? Right, we're thread hunting, we are doing proactive analysis, we're running our rules, you know, all the, mm -hmm. all the same things you can do forever. Yeah. Right. And then, and then once we see something, uh, like for example, if, um, you know, there's a breach, we need to investigate it. We need to go back to all of our logs and answer all these questions. Like, you know, yes. that's, yes. and I want to not wait for the answer also. Like if I, if I am investigating, nobody has, nobody has time to take a coffee break 
query. They, they, the people would maybe take a multi-second query sometimes, but of course they would prefer not to bias things our way, kind of a Google speed for search. Like they want stuff to come up right away and they wouldn't want to say, yeah, well, it would take five minutes. And then you remind them that 10 years ago, some queries took three hours and people were okay with that. So if you collect all that volume of data, real-time detection, running rules, hunting, investigation, and workflow, and attribute it to one system, and then you demand very quick response to pretty much every query, even if going back months, maybe not years, I think something like a modern data lake would have to be the backend. Yes. I'm saying this with some hesitations because I feel like there's still a bit of a degree of debate about what truly constitutes data lake. I think your definition makes sense to me that it's a system that decouples compute from storage. So if yeah. I have, so the 10,000 MySQL servers would not be a data lake. Yeah. That'd be a home, a homegrown data warehouse. I mean, that's effectively what yes, data warehousing is, is yeah. right? It's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah commodity storage, it's all these things. So I don't know if this is right, but I, would you consider BigQuery a data warehouse, cloud data warehouse, similar to... This gets this gets into an area where I, I don't have the crisp enough definition to say that if what would be the data lake versus warehouse versus like modern storage. I mean, we do say cloud data warehouse if you go to the BigQuery webpage. So this is like mm-hmm. as far as I would go. I also feel like the terms evolved because I think the where, term data warehouse is... I don't think it's the 1980s, but it's probably 1990s, right? Uh, when the, the term was invented. I think there's also a definition modernization thing that's ongoing. A data lake, now I almost feel like I want to Google for the term data lake and figure out when this was first introduced. But I wouldn't be shocked if it's a while. I mean, it has to be the last five years, is my guess. Data lake? No, I guess. Longer? I guess longer, yeah. So back in the Gartner days, even in the early part of my Gartner days. So that means probably 12, 2012, 2013, when Hadoop emerged, a mm-hmm. lot of people were obsessing about how Hadoop is going to revolutionize security data analysis and whatnot. There were a bunch of vendors who said that we're going to use Hadoop and we're going to be unbeatable. You you guys with RDBMS is going to lose out. But magic largely didn't happen. So I think Data Lake is probably older than five years. It's only become main, more mainstream though in the last few years, I would say. Yes, for sure. And the, the obsession that it better be a data lake be, is definitely more recent. Uh, so Bart thinks it's 2010 term, but I mean, the term appearance versus technology being seen as critical. Yeah, you're probably right. It would. So that means what, 13 years ago. So maybe five, seven years ago, more people started talking about data lakes. So you had a few comments. I think you've said this a few times around MySQL. You're like, MySQL is not a security yeah, query language. A, I don't know why I'm picking on MySQL. It's uh, probably no. because nobody nobody cares about them anymore or something. I don't know. But why? Why do you feel so negatively? And by the way, I, I don't disagree with you. I think MySQL is not the language for that. But what's your reasoning for it? Oh, sorry. No, it wasn't the language. It was... So yeah, it's two things. I made slight remarks about SQL for data analysis. But in this case, I meant MySQL as a as a database, which right. at, at the time, it wasn't known for like scaling. So if you add more things, it may scale eventually, but it would be sort of through an ad hoc solution. But I made slight remarks about SQL as a way to do security data analysis. And that's a whole other uh, possibly useful avenue to pursue. Hopefully we wouldn't make anybody mad by this. There's so many different conflicting wants from the market, because I also hear people are like, well, you know what? I want to be able to take my data and go somewhere else one day. And if that just goes so against the whole concept of a no. workflow. I mean, it never worked in our domain in, 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 in SIM. Like even if you look at, go back to some old times and when two SIMs would use Oracle for storage, does it mean you can keep your Oracle, cut off your SIM, put another SIM? Of course not. Because everybody used, everybody used Oracle differently in all sorts of subtle, bizarre ways. And I don't think storage was replaceable, even if it's the same storage. Look at all the multi petabyte migrations I had. Somebody says, I had Splunk for 10 years. Now I want to migrate to Panther. How about that? <laughs> A random example. And I mean, they're not really copying every bit of data from Splunk to Panther. That's, that's uh, the pain versus value of this effort is too, too staggering. And especially in Splunk, where the it's schema on read. Mm-hmm. That's like a perfect example, right? It's like Splunk has all the 
knowledge of knowing how this uh, schema on read really gets operationalized. Mm-hmm. I think it's kind of the same story with with any data. And by the way, I didn't pay Anton to plug Panther. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Uh, I try to always stay as neutral as possible and just talk about like the, the, the core of like the issues behind these things. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think it, it's a pattern I'm seeing in iceberg too. Uh, like projects like OCSF, which are trying to be neutral on, on mm-hmm. log schema formats. Yep. Iceberg and there's, uh, there's two others that are particularly notable, which is Delta and, um, and hoodie, Apache hoodie. And they're all open source projects. And the whole idea is that. Uh, it's an open table format. So when you're querying a data lake, you can basically swap the engine out and then it knows where the data is because all the table metadata is in an open place. This decoupling metadata from storage. Exactly. From the, from the query engine. From the query, query engine. Because yeah, yeah. historically what you would do is you would basically say, and this is how Snowflake works, you put your data in S3 and then you upload it to Snowflake and then it's copied into Snowflake. It's, it's compressed. It's, Mm-hmm. column based it's all these things yep. and it has all the metadata there and same with amazon you use glue which is the metadata store yep. all these yep. things right um and then with uh with spark based systems which basically all this is by the way that's kind of the yep. point i make in the in the blog post which is like we're basically all just spark at the end of the day there's all these various components and and now there's this push for more neutrality which is really fascinating to me but i don't see how it really plays out fully if you're trying to be a workflow tool right uh and 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 how you interface with that data is so dependent mm-hmm. on performance which is true right like you can't just like swap in and be like okay cool now i'm going to magically solve all my high scale problems cuz you don't know anything about the data now and you have to go learn about the data for it to be meaningful and that's true with any system right like and relearn not just learn but relearn because you may have you may have learned it at tool x you migrated it to tool y and some of the metadata is is not portable no matter how many of these efforts gain prominence, right? Parsing peculiarities and then their X or their Y. I don't think that's solvable probably ever in our, in our beloved domain of cyber, right? Yeah. H- how like you parse things in a particular way, Chronicle parses things in a particular way, Splunk, what do we call it? The common information model parses right. them in a different way. And uh, we may have opinionated differences about where what goes. So I don't see how a generic metadata layer can ever exist. Unless logs are standardized, like then back to OCSF. But I think that's another windmill we may have to fight for a while, right? I just see this pattern of everyone's trying to be the data lake right now. I see everyone's trying to be the data lake, and then I also see everyone's trying to be the sim. Because Well, everybody's trying to be a sim is, I, I'm not sure you're right. What do you mean well, everybody? Like, I'll give you an example. Sim is hard. Sim is hard. Look at some of the acquisitions we saw in the last few years. And when I say few years, I mean like, I don't know, like three, yeah. three four years. Mm-hmm. CrowdStrike and Sentinel One are perfect examples, right? right? Yes, they were using Splunk or Splunk-ish mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. because their customers wanted a way to query through the logs, and then now they've they're bringing it in house. and And to me, it seems like they're trying to just be a sim now, yep. right? Yeah, that's going to yep. conflict with the data platforms because what Snowflake and Databricks doing? They're trying to be this ecosystem of of data, mm-hmm. and they're trying to be the gold standard. and And I would argue they are the gold standard for those things for data engineering, for data storage, for like all those things, like that's their whole bread and butter. And, and, you know, Databricks, obviously founders of Spark, right? Like years, years of intuition, those things. And same with stuff like stuff, like they're both doing the same thing ultimately mm-hmm. in different ways, but it just seems like everyone's racing to be that data store and it doesn't seem but like, so, but they're all doing integrated in that sense. In that sense, they're all not doing decoupled. They're all doing. We bought a vendor that built its own unique data store for logs. We're going to incorporate it in our other tech, right? Like that's, it's almost like there's an epic battle of people who rely on say Snowflake, BigQuery or other scalable cloud storage. And the other side is people who build their own. Mm-hmm. And at some point there will be some kind of a showdown, right? <laughs> when, when the people who backend to sort of stock, but modern storage would have to fight vendors who backend to homegrown storage yeah. modern as well but homegrown for their purpose and i i don't know i mean maybe you should do a, this podcast in three years and see which side won or whether there's like some kind of a uneven truce the thing that i do know is that the products that grow fast solve very specific problems and i think that's why crowdstrike is a great example of that 
and other cloud security vendors. Like it's just very well defined. And I think when you start introducing trying to be the sim, it's like you're probably going to get some of that from your own data, but trying to pull all of the logs into that is going to be really hard unless you are the yes. you're at the center of gravity. So yes. yeah, I don't I don't really know what the solution is, but I feel like the cloud platforms and the data platforms have the most potential from my perspective because they're best suited to operate at scale and apply the proper data engineering practices for something like a decoupled model to work. Mm -hmm. That's basically- but, Okay, so let's, I agree with you, but let's let's go in a time machine together and fly to 2007 and say, and then you'd make an argument that every SIM would back into Oracle because Oracle really knows data and they are the scalable, data store and every big business uses Oracle and Oracle is mm. great and the no and 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 you build this case that every sim should use Oracle and that's the, the best choice. And in 2008, I'd be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, yep. And then in a year, Splunk would appear and we'd be proven wrong. So why? And I, I'm not trying to, by the way, I am saying this not to be argumentative. I'm just genuinely trying to test the hypothesis. Like, so imagine we are having this argument and you just convinced me that yes, Every sim forever would back into Oracle. They just know data. But then in two years, Splunk appears, Elastic appears, and things turn to a different direction. Mm -hmm. Why can't this happen today? Just replace, you know, Oracle with Snowflake. Like, you build a good case why they should be the center, and then they're not. Well, I'm a huge believer that we need to go back and learn from the past. Mm -hmm. I think the past is often the most indicative uh, hint to the future. So... You know, I, I certainly, you're certainly inspiring me in, in a few ways, but where my mind goes is that it seems like the solution here is someone needs to be the platform, like the security specific platform in some way. Oh, okay. That's so maybe that, the, yeah, that, that's a, that's a good third choice. There would be a security specific data storage ideal for telemetry mm -hmm. and they would be the backend, but that, that's, that's an interesting one. Actually, the inspiration I got from that was if you look at look at Datadog, they're mm -hmm. I think a great example of this. They are an observability company that is going really hard into security, and because they have all the data, they already have the data and workflow flowing through their mm -hmm. system. It's it's just a channel at this point. They're like, cool, you want to do this with security? It's probably not going to be the like high scale log analytics thing that you want, mm -hmm. but it is going to solve like X Y Z basic needs and. I think for some people that's good enough, but obviously for others, as you point out, the teams that want decoupled are the ones who have these like big data analytical needs. It just seems like maybe someone, yeah, maybe that's maybe that's the third option here, which is that those underlying platforms are just implementation details, which is probably the best thing anyway, right? Like why should it mm -hmm. matter to the buyer what it is? If they are buying one thing, who cares if it's running whatever, like there, there's a bunch of options these days too for OLAP, right? There's like ClickHouse. But if I'm investigating, I want an immediate answer. Like I don't yeah. want to have the, uh, and ideally I also don't want to know, uh, you know, SQL, KQL or SPL. I don't want, I just want to, and no, I'm not trying to say AI bot would transcend this, but ultimately I want very quick search without knowing the details of a language, right? Like this yeah. to me is a kind of a natural use case. Like I want to know what I want to know. I want it now. And I don't want to learn a language for it. Like this is probably true. And I, I and another sad story from a good number of years ago, which I think would date me again, is a question about reporting. Like you have reports in your product. Uh, we have reports in our product. Uh, other people have reports. Pretty much everybody who does SIM in any shape or form has reports. And many, many years ago, some sim vendor said, we're going to use crystal reports. I don't even know crystal reports, whether they still exist, but it was a 90s thing, which would plug into a database and you can do reports. And they said, they're the best at reports. We're just going to use their reports. And ultimately, that approach made total sense and it completely crashed. <laughs> Nobody has canned reporting built not by the security vendor in their security product, or almost nobody, maybe some people do. So this is almost like sometimes you go follow some intuitive thread 
and logically you arrive at the conclusion and you look outside of your window and it's not what happened. The thing I've always believed is the the company has to be a security company in some way. And I guess Splunk proves that wrong, but they're probably the outlier. That's my suspicion. This is like we are we are ta- sort of playing the armchair analysts uh, on on TV, well, <laughs> on, on 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 the podcast. But I suspect that it's the case. And I've met some people who were inspired by this example, gave it their all, and failed. So, which sort of confirms the outlier theory that mm-hmm. if you are a general slash IT slash data platform and you say hey, I'm going to sprinkle some security dust. I'm going to be a security vendor just like Splunk. And then they forget that Splunk worked hard for 10 years, or for years, before they became a robust SIM vendor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just them deciding and saying, ah, security, it's pretty much the same search by by very smart people over many years. That's true. And a lot of it is the content around it as well. I mean, that's a huge Mm -hmm. part of this for the same reason that We even said before that people just want to solve their problem and they don't want to start from nothing. And I think that that's actually a really good evidence to support this integrated approach. I don't want to sell you on a classic sim from long time ago, but like if I have content engine and data that perfectly well, perfectly work together well, fast, easy, effective, detect threats, I would want that, but under the hood, you may well have decoupled storage from vendor, you know, X or S or whatever. Mm-hmm. But as a user, I do want my content, my engine that runs the content and my storage that engine refers to, to work together well. And mm-hmm. in case of Splunk, it's the same vendor. In case of, you know, Panther is two vendors, right? <laughs> Essentially the U and the storage. Yeah. And somebody else tried to do it from three vendors where somebody has the engine Somebody has content and somebody has backend. That hasn't really worked for anybody yeah. last time I checked. Uh, but that the, the, the user, as a user, I want content engine and backend to be friends, to be married, to be harmoniously working together. What do you think's behind the incentive for OCSF? Is that, I, don't, oh. I mean, I, I sort of get like the, you know, for the better of security, I guess, but you have two big businesses pushing this. Why do you why do you think that is? They don't integrate either, like Splunk and, I, and Amazon are. I genuinely think it's an effort to benefit the community. I I don't think I'm not aware of any secret agenda, and I suspect there isn't any. Uh, this is the you know natural desire of people to not do stupid parsing work I agree individually, and and I mean, you have an integration lab, and every other sim vendor would have an integration lab, and their integration lab are hard at work since. I don't know, I, the exact birth year for SIM, 1997. So somebody somewhere has been cranking device integrations nonstop in some basement since 1997. <laughs> like, that's like a horrible thought. <laughs> it's a horrible thought. True. And and imagine that you show up and say, with OCSF, you can stop. You can stop doing that thing that you've been doing since 1997 and, and things would still work. That's amazing. Like yeah. I... Back compelling. when I was passionate about this and tried MITRE common event expression, CEE, we thought we can do it. Ultimately, CEE failed and, and there was no long standard. And OCSF is the current champion, current leader of standardizing, normalizing logs so that 20 SIM vendors would not have to maintain data sub- integration labs for decades. And do build in, you know, has anybody asked you to build a parser for Windows 2000? I'm curious. It's, it's a legit question. What about Windows no. 2003? What about Windows 2003? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. No, not yet. Okay, good. So then maybe 2008, maybe you do support. No, it's do, do not have that. You, you know, to me, this is like, if it saves me time, I may not care if it saves you time as well, I, I, as long as I save enough time. So to me, this is a little push behind OCSF, like it ultimately mm-hmm. make things better for all of us. It definitely makes the training of how to do the SIM job easier. Yes. It also makes understanding of the data, makes training the future algorithms, analytic modules, AI, whatever else easier sure. because the data is normalized. Yeah, or- you can transfer learnings. You can do other yeah. things. In theory, you can train data on vendor S and then move to vendor Y and then res- reserve some of the training. So this is like maybe far-fetched, but 
if we both use the same schema, then then it's fine. I mean, to, to, as a minor side point, there are some people who say that, who naively say that SIM vendors are not incentivized to support a log standard because uh, ultimately they prefer to charge customers for their integration labs. I think that to me is kind of more of a conspiracy theory. I don't think it's it's the truth. I think that if if I am a SIM vendor and somebody says, starting Monday, all logs are normalized, I would be like, now I can compete on security and not on the who has fewer bugs and stupid parsers. I like that line, you know, competing on security and not on not on data pipeline. I think that makes a lot of sense because that's the ultimate value that those vendors need to provide anyway. So what are, what are the takeaways, Anton? What can we leave leave folks with today <laughs> listening to this conversation? One point I wanted to make is that we are probably too early to call in terms of the quote unquote correct or best storage backend for a modern SIM. I think that you make a really good case that something like Snowflake works well. And people like Splunk make a really strong case that the homegrown, but purpose-grown, purpose-built storage is a good answer. Our friends in Microsoft and actually, well, Google, well, with Chronicle, make a case that the homegrown modern storage for logs is the right choice. So I actually don't know who's right. Uh, some people back into BigQuery. They are um, Exabeam. I think they back into BigQuery. They're making a case that BigQuery is the right choice. So I don't know a what's the right choice and b whether there is a right choice. It's more. It's actually even more complicated across clouds too, because you have big enterprises who live in multiple clouds. So that also throws a wrench into things. Well, Snowflake. Your answer, your version of an answer is fine with that, right? Mostly. Mostly. Oh, okay. I mean, there's a whole other thing we didn't talk about, which is like query federation. Like, is that right. a thing, right? Like, who knows? There's its own downsides to that too. Yes. That's, of course, my previous uh, somewhat annoying blog about federated storage and federated queries and whether it can ever work across vendors. But that's mm -hmm. another, that's a big debate for the for the future, I think, as well. Yeah, I need to read that. That sounds really interesting. It's but almost yeah. like people say, people hear us debate this and say, I hate you all. I don't want storage. <laughs> I just want to send query into the other and have it bring data from storage paid by some suckers somewhere, but not me. Like, I want that too, but I don't know if I can have that. And are there enough people who would hold logs reliably for me without me paying for it? It definitely does seem too early to call. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's too much evolving too fast. I mean, even OCSF is only just at V1 as an example of a thing we talked about. And Snowflake and Databricks and these other, I mean, even Amazon, right? Like, like the security lake is now emerging as a mm -hmm. player in the space. So it's too early to see how that will materialize. But I think for people to say it's important to at least understand the dynamics that are changing. And that was why that's why I wrote my blog because I felt like that was a pattern that we're seeing consistently that could solve a lot of the problems that people talk about. Yes, that's very true, and I think that that's a good one. The, the, the dynamic, like it's not about like we talked for an hour and we have the answer for you, and here's the answer. It's more about we have the forces that are at work, and we outline the forces, and then now you can do your own math or do your own physics and judge where the forces would lead you. Somebody may go and buy Curator as a result and be fine. I'm so I'm too biased for that. Uh, <laughs> but I thought this was great. Uh, really appreciate your insight as always. Um, looking forward to see uh, what blogs come from this and what what people think and um, and how things change in the next few years. I think it's going to be interesting. And at the end of the day, the most that we can do is guide people on on how to make the right decisions and and how to solve their security problems. I mean, that's why I. That's why I, I became a founder. I wanted to help with that. And I felt like at the time um, when I was a practitioner that we needed a more scalable data backend. And that was one thing that I was very certain about. And that's why I became a founder. And things have changed a lot since then. And now data lakes are more industry accepted. But I didn't even realize it at the time that that's what that was. Um, I was just a security guy, right? And I was very naive on data engineering, but I learned. 
Um, so as long as we can continue paying attention to this and, and help folks solve their security problems so we have less breaches, I think that's ultimately the, the goal here. Whatever storage they use, as long as we can detect well, reliably, and without breaking the bank. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of forces at play, especially with uh, all the cost savings needs that we have today from interest rates and things like that. So it's a good point. But I really appreciate your time. I had a great time talking with you. And we should do it again in like a year. Okay. And then we'll look back and be yeah. like, all right, let's react to this video. <laughs> <laughs> now that's right. Yes, that's a good idea. Looking forward to it. Cool. Thanks, Anton. <laughs>